For me, I need to keep it practical. I am rarely the smartest person in the room. And so I want to be really clear around what's the problem I think I can help solve. How will I know that we've moved the needle and what will success look like? Those sorts of questions, I think, help keep us on track. And by that, I mean, help us see that when it is all going to hell in a handbag, you know, we can we we can remind ourselves that we are working towards something bigger than all of us. This podcast series, Queensland Women, Inspiring Stories from Environmental Champions, gives voice to the vital environment support and ecological sustainability work undertaken by inspiring women practitioners, advocates and thought leaders in this state. We hope that it offers our audience and particularly women listeners energising ideas and encouraging role models which can help motivate them as they develop their own contributions toward building a genuinely sustainable future in this place. To be clear, that would be a future based upon much improved levels of human and other species health and well-being, much improved levels of social fairness and an authentic, sustainable economic prosperity which leaves no one behind. The series was produced for Hope Incorporated Australia in Toowoomba, Queensland, on and adjacent to the traditional lands of the Jarawa, Guyabal, Yugara and Waka Waka peoples of the surrounding region. Hope pays respect to the past, present and emerging leaders of all First Nation Australians in this country and celebrates the unique contributions their cultures make to this place. Those contributions include Indigenous spiritual respect and care for country, the sovereignty of which was never ceded. We acclaim Indigenous stewardship of the nature of Australia, undertaken over many, many thousands of years, and the model that stewardship provides us now in this place, as we survey and attempt to repair some of the environmental damage created by the often misguided development approaches of only the last 200 years or so. Hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Nicholson and I am the producer of the podcast series. My guest in this podcast episode, Julia Spicer OAM, is a vibrant rural entrepreneur and a catalyst for change. She is founder of several regional businesses based in Gundawindi, Queensland, including Engage and Create Consulting and the Gundawindi Business Hub. Julia says her mission is to contribute to the vibrancy and viability of rural and regional Australia by helping businesses grow. She pursues that mission through strategic planning, coaching and online courses, helping grow the activity and impact of innovation into the farming and business communities across the state. She has a particular gift for engaging women and Indigenous businesses in her work, and she assists entrepreneurs and business owners with the work of business plan writing, designing value propositions and attracting grant and investment funds. Julia's impactful work across the years has resulted in high-level recognition in many forms, including award of the OAM in 2022 for service to regional business and organisations. In 2018, she was cited as one of the Australian Financial Review's 100 Women of Influence and Queensland Government's 100 Faces of Small Business. Her senior managerial experience has also provided impact in a wide range of board leadership roles. Currently, she is a board member on the Queensland Government Innovation Advisory Council, Global Entrepreneur Network Australia and Motherland Australia. Her past board roles have included work with Regional Development Australia for Darling Downs, South West Queensland, the Queensland Government Small Business Advisory Council, the YWCA Queensland and the Australian Land Management Group. So welcome, Julia. And after outlining that stellar career history, I'm really looking forward to uh, talking with you today. Equally, Andrew, I'm looking forward to the conversation we'll have. So let's start our conversation on your story, your professional story, by asking you to go back in time and recall a bit of that early personal background of your environmental support interests. That first question is, do you remember how your passion for the environment started? I do. I do. And I think growing up on our family farm, that has certainly, you know, was always connected to uh, both the animals and the landscape. Uh, so so that beautiful mix of natural resource management, how are we looking at 
pastures, what were the activities we were doing uh, in terms of vegetation management, etc. But also this love and and nurturing of the animals on that landscape. So both cattle, sheep, goats. Looking at looking at what uh, was happening and the interaction or the the intersection, I should say, between uh, between that and our native plants and animals. So that was certainly where my my love, my understanding, and my passion for sustainable ag and natural resource management started. And then uh, and then I guess I was was um, consistent enough, maybe the word, to follow that through into um, into into work and and ongoing life. You know, it's interesting already in this series, we have a couple of interviews uh, already lined up and talking to people in in the regenerative agriculture space, for instance. But I think it's a common theme that comes out of talking to people who are interested in environmental support, connected to the environment in some way, have some passion for it. They'll often cite this early childhood experience. Perhaps that is not surprising, but just to emphasize that. Um, you know, they've, they've been connected to nature for whatever reason. And I think, you know, that just goes to this situation we have now where kids are often being brought up, perhaps not quite so connected anymore. Early connection with nature tends to lead to a lifelong affection, regard, not always, but seemingly often. The research seems to bear that out. So the moral of the story might be let's hopefully have more kids involved with more nature experiences, uh, you know, down the track. Okay, as we move on then, um, and when talking about early formative experiences like you just have there, within a calling or across a professional career, people often refer to the significance of other people who influenced them on the journey. So the next question is, is there anyone in particular in your background you remember who inspired or mentored you in your work? Yeah, so there's there's two people I'd like to flag here, Andrew, and I would actually say that one is my dad. So I, I would like to add dad to the list. Um, and I think particularly because he was always looking at how we could do what we were doing in slightly different ways. So from an early age, you know, we were looking at how we could diversify activity on the farm to really make sure we were able to look after the base foundations, which was the environment. Uh, he's always been really involved in sort of animal um, welfare and, and wildlife caring and, and those kinds of things. So I think, you know, that that really was something that linked for us. Um, and, and so certainly in terms of how we encourage others to love the land, uh, mum and dad also started a farm state and had on farm accommodation long before it was a trendy thing to do. And so we got to really be part of, as you say, city families who maybe didn't have that connection. We got to help connect them back to uh, agriculture and back to land. And, and I think that was really important. And so so certainly um, Dad was a massive influence in that regard. But our, one of the other influences for me was uh, one of our neighbours who also ended up with a part-time job with National Parks. So he worked for Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service um, through the week and then was working on their property next door to us on the weekends. And it was a really good example. He worked on a lot of the unstaffed um, national parks, so not necessarily the massive tourist attractions, but these pieces of country that had massive Indigenous um, assets, you know, lots of beautiful uh, rock art and stories, um, potentially some you know some really rare vegetation types in our part of the world and and to hear and see the work he did in protecting managing sustaining these national parks uh, and then what that meant in terms of what he was bringing home and implementing on his own property on the weekends I found that a really um a really beautiful combination and and certainly the work that Bill did I yeah that was certainly somebody I looked up to in terms of how you could practically take this environmental management concept and see it play out in, in different types of landscape, but also on different types of ownership, owner of land, you know, private and public land management. What in just picking up on that, uh, some fantastic early experiences you had there, you know, both in your family context, but also talking about that influential character, national parks. Also being exposed to both natural history, you know, nature, but also cultural history. I mean, what mm. a fantastic combination. No wonder, you know, you're you're so passionate around these areas. And I, I just think also it's always good to have uh, evidential research backing up this understanding, intuitive understanding that nature is inspirational. Nature can be good for you. Being out in nature is either, you know, equally fascinating, inspirational, um, health-giving. 
uh, the nature connectedness research that's now coming out from a whole series of different centers around the world. So, and also that link into First Nations um, cultural heritage uh, influence. And I know that you, you know, you're across that sort of space in regards to your work as well. So uh, just amazing to pull those strands together. Well, we were also really lucky that, you know, um, and it's a big topic. It's a whole other uh, podcast for us, Andrew. But, you know, we were really lucky where we were in a position where we could learn uh, from our local traditional owner groups uh, what our part of the landscape meant to them historically. So our farm is on the Bungle Creek, which is north of Roma and, and you know, really is from the headwaters of the uh, Murray-Darling Basin and also right, you know, starts pretty much on the Great Dividing Range just near, just north of Roma. And so, you know, we we were able to find out and learn at a young age, you know, our farm was part of the kind of historical highway from, you know, um, along the Bungle Creek that it was part of where people met. It was the link that got people from sort of southern areas along the along the border up into the Carnarvon Gorge and along the ranges there. So, you know, and that was what we found along our creeks and in some of the rivers, you know, that that aligned with what we could see in the landscape of of what pe- how people had traversed that country thousands and thousands of years before we were there. I think again, just you know, you, you're having this enlightened connection uh, with First mm. Nations cultural history, you know, the the trackways, the paths across the landscape. Um yeah, and again, I, I suppose coming right to up to 2023 and the present, you know, that that sort of now, that new interest, a renewed interest perhaps in some quarters of uh, First Nations capacity, Indigenous uh, cultural capacity to tell us more about land management, about the management of the continent, which they've been on for, depending on who you listen to, you know, 60,000 or more years. I can understand, you know, the background sort of just emerging out of the interview here in a sense. It's great. Um cool. But now moving on, you know, from sources of inspiration, of which there obviously were many in your case, uh, to hands-on application in terms of your early environmental support work on the ground. Next question is, how did you get involved with environmental conservation to begin with? Yeah, thank you for that question. So I um, I did an environmental science degree uh, through University of Queensland at their Gatton campus. Uh, mm. And so that was a four-year degree from 90 19- to 2001 uh, and and I guess during that time I very much was interested in subjects and I remember choosing some electives around cultural heritage management. We got to spend some time over on Stradbroke Island with Pondamooka people looking at you know how they were rehabilitating after sand mines and different activities over there uh, and I guess I've always had this interesting um um, passion or interest between the environment and the people in the environment. And and so as much as, you know, I, I often think the environment would be fine if we humans could work out how we actually want to live with it rather than on it. Um, and so, you know, I did, I did work experience when I was in high school at a koala hospital for a little while. I thought I might be a vet. Then I realised how much I'd have to study, so I slightly changed my mind. Um, but I... Um, I yeah I, I did some uh, work experience or some pla- industrial placement through university with national parks actually looking at how we best support and um, and promote unstaffed national parks and the more we open up places what does that mean in terms of needing to protect it you know we need to provide services for people to come you know we need rubbish bins and toilets but how many rubbish bins and toilets because we don't necessarily want so many people coming that they're going to destroy the artwork or they're going to impact the vegetation or so it's a really interesting way to look at the pros and cons of things always and and do we keep things almost secret from the world so that they are protected or how do we provide information to people so that they understand the beauty and can share the beauty, but also know that they're responsible for protecting it. And that was really the work that I did with National Park um, for a while. Uh, and and as I mentioned, you know, we got grew up in a beautiful part of the world just south of the Carnarvon Gorge. So I had a job at during university um, where on the holidays where I worked for one of the campgrounds and did everything from you know, checked campers in to chop firewood and clean toilets kind of thing, but but always in this most beautiful environment of the gorge up there and 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 this beautiful landscape. So, 
Yeah, really from an early age and, and all the way through have been able to kind of be connected to the environment and then saw that through working with, um, you know, t- taking that into employment in, um, in many different opportunities. Thanks for that. Again, you know, just amazing set of stories there. I, I, again, just one theme I, pu- I pull out of that because, again, I think it's particularly relevant. Um, that understanding, you know, both either through your, you know, uh, uh, university level training, um, tertiary level training, but also working on the ground, it's it's always about looking at the nature person nature people uh, connection having to work with the realities of that you know people are embedded in nature we are part of nature we are nature but you know making that work i think it sort of you know bolts on to a whole series of new formulations about attempting to achieve sustainability you know whether that's across um, formulations like people planet prosperity um, nature people mm. connection human health and well-being and planetary health and well-being there's, there's a i think a growing realization finally that to make this work, to make sustainability work, it has to be about environment, the physical environment, nature, and people. You've got to have, which may have been always obvious to a lot of people like, like ourselves, but not so much to make it work on the ground. But it's finally coming home to roost, I think. You know, we can work mm. with nature. We can create more sustainable, uh, long-enduring natural systems, but we have to be thinking about the well-being of the people within them as well. Mm. Yep, yeah, agree. So thanks for that, Julia. Now, as we move now further through your story, thinking about your work and life experience as it developed more fully, people sometimes talk about having that light bulb or aha moment, you know, when the penny dropped, they realized that their work was having a significant or beneficial impact in some way. I mean, it sounds to me like that must have occurred to you very early on in the piece, but nonetheless, just to ask you specifically, do you recall a specific moment in time when you first realized what impact your work was having in helping to protect or restore the environment? Uh, I I do, Andrew, and and it was probably a a low penny drop for me, to be honest, Uh, and it was when I was working for land care and catchment groups in Western Queensland, and what we were doing was hosting field days and workshops and having these meetings at people's properties, like at people's places, to talk about a whole range of environmental topics or sustainable agriculture topics, and what would often happen was... um, both the husband and wife were at the event, but when we came to talk about the technical activity or when we moved into the the topics of the day or the meeting as such, the women would leave and I would be left with the men. <laughs> um, and and I asked one day why why some of the women weren't staying for the conversations about salinity maps or veg management planning or whatever whatever the topic might have been. And what some people would say was, oh, I don't really know what's happening. You know, I don't want to embarrass my husband by asking a question so I won't come. Or no, no, that's not my part. You know, I look after the kids or I just do the books or whatever it might be. And 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 what a couple of us really quickly realised was that we needed both the husband and wife to be at the decision-making table because they bring different strengths um, and different interests, and and you know through some of the research we know that the women are often more interested in the long term outlook of the property. They're more interested in the succession planning. They want to have those conversations early so everybody knows where they stand. They're often more interested in the environmental management and the actual monitoring side of things. Um, and and so what we set about so so we realised that we actually only had half of the business making decisions for the whole of the business. Um, or half of the decision makers making decisions for all of the business. Uh, And so what we set about doing was developing a program of workshops, a series of workshops specifically for women, and and we call them naturally resourceful. This is, you know, 20-something years ago now. And what we did was really use those workshops to have the conversations often we were having with husbands but do it in an environment that was specific for the women. Uh, we did some professional and personal development. We did some behaviour style training so they could understand the sorts of personalities in their businesses and in their families and often in generational businesses. And that was just extraordinary. So so they ran for years. They, we ended up being asked to run them all over Queensland and then all over Australia. Um, you know, there's groups that we did workshops with almost 20 years ago who still meet regularly to this day. That's the connection that was made. Uh, and I uh, and I remember, I, I, I won't say what pub I was in because that will uh, quickly uh, geolocate me, but um, 
I remember standing in a pub and one of the fellas coming up to me, one of the husbands coming up going, bloody hell, Julia, because of you, I've had to go and put in all of these logs again because my wife's realised that the reason she lost all the wrens out of the garden was because I cleared up all of the pot, all of the logs and all of the, um, you know, rubbish in the paddock and and that's the link. That was how the wrens were getting from the creek vegetation through the paddock into our garden and I got rid of this and then that's what's happened. And and so the so that, you know, that meant that the conversation we were having about birds as a um, indicator species for the health of your property had gone from the classroom, so to speak, to around the kitchen table to the link of what that had actually meant in terms of what had happened on farm to the request to put the logs back in the paddock to get the wrens back into the garden. And I remember thinking, well, that's pretty cool that that's that's a conversation we were, not just me, but a couple of us were part of creating and and having those conversations. So I um, I said to him, I said, get hopping, you know. You know, I've got no dramas with taking the blame for that conversation. That's uh, I'm really happy for you to go and uh, put in some ways for the wrens to get from the garden Back to the back to the creek and back again. So yeah, that's probably one of those standout moments for me. I think again, fantastic anecdotes. Um, the wrens that that will just stay in my mind now. But you know, looking at the bigger picture here, you know, you tapping into uh, and cha- and seeking a change in that change agent role, what you might term dominant men's business. Uh, you're bringing <laughs> in women's business, but in the in the full recognition, you know, and again, I suppose that's increasingly been borne out. There's more definite research there's more definite initiatives on the ground now it's always been known many voices gender inclusive male and female voices are going to lead to better decision making a 360 degree or you know concept whatever it is we need as many different and diverse viewpoints as possible around a decision making table and you were just looking at there in terms of you know uh, property management the male and female experience I have heard this already, again, you know, going back to interviews already uh, conducted for this podcast series of women on the land, um, women in, involved in regenerative agriculture uh, activities on the land, talking about their very, you know, passionate focus. Often, though, citing, to be fair, citing the male, uh, you know, models that their partners, uh, for instance, or other influential males have given them. But nonetheless, you know, a striking view on their of their own view as women, uh, as and what they see is important and what needs to be done. So, you know, it's amazing to really hear that uh, very early work going back two decades, in your case, um, that you, you were into that and, and that recognition early on in the piece. Now, let's extend what you've been talking about there, Julia, um, based on those past observations of the important roles and interests of women specifically, um, you know, for instance, in regenerative agriculture, land care, other environmental management sectors. As a woman yourself, uh, what are some of your own environmental achievements? I mean, you've already listed them. You've already answered this question, really, but perhaps there's other opportunities to come up with more. Uh, what are some of the environmental achievements that you are particularly satisfied with or proud of and why? I mean, you just cited one there, but yeah, yeah, I am really proud of the work that I was part of with the Naturally Resourceful Program. In the end, there was probably 500 women from across Queensland who were part of those programs over a period of years and many events and programs have used that concept as a basis for, for them. So I think there's real legacy uh, and real change that has happened as a result of that. I genuinely think families have stayed together you know, because of those programs, because, you know, the women had an opportunity to come together and talk, not just with those of us that presented information, but with each other. It was a different conversation to be, they were encouraged to have with people in their community. Certainly excited and, and happy for the role I played there. And 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 equally, I think this piece of um, how we can genuinely value the role that women play in regional economic development. So, so, so often, you know, I said earlier, you know, women would just say, oh, well, I'm, I just look after the kids or I just do the books. And I'm like, you're a multi-million dollar turnover business. If you were just doing the books in a business the same size in downtown Roma, Longreach or Gundawindi, you're the chief financial officer. Give yourself a title. You don't just do the books. So I think we need to value the role. There was some research done years ago that showed if something happened and a woman was taken out of an agricultural business, it would cost about $350,000 to replace the roles that she plays, teacher, cook, bookkeeper, chief accountant, 
chief HR operations manager, whatever it might be, right? So, so I think I'm really, I'm really, I am really proud of the the role that I've played over the years with others in in making sure that we genuinely value the role that women play in our rural communities, because often in times of um, drought or crisis, whatever natural disaster it might be, you know, it was the women who would ramp up the off-farm income, whether that's teaching, nursing, and off-farm business that they could do, whatever that might be. But but I think often that's not valued on the balance sheet of the farm. And I think that's a missed opportunity to really make sure we're capturing the skill set that we have in the region. So, so in lots of ways, I've done lots of work around supporting the role of women and making sure that their role is, is, is genuinely um, advocated for. And then that's come across into, you know, making sure we're also supporting Indigenous women across the communities and that their voice is heard and that their leadership opportunity is able to, you know, they're able to really step into that. So lots of highlights, but I guess in keeping with theme, I really was keen to raise a couple of those. I mean, again, at a bigger picture level, I'm always interested in perhaps drawing out the lessons, you know, from what a specific guest might be saying in terms of their specific interests. But I mean, here, what we're talking about, of course, is that whole area, and it's very large of the undervalued, under-recognised and often under-remunerated aspect of women's contribution to society. And again, you've actually been in there at an early stage doing your bit on that. So I'm fantastic to hear it. I mean, that's going to be a life, a generational debate. I mean, we there's so many areas that need further work. This podcast series has come about partly as a result of that connected to the Queensland state government's initiatives in in getting more voices of women to be heard around different topics empowerment to women etc so and and they, again staying with that i suppose in a, in a slightly tangential way but um as again as we move through further into your environmental support interests and professional contributions but then they're, they're more than that clearly as you're talking here because we're talking about almost you know we are it is social justice stuff we're talking about here as well as much as much as anything else advocacy um getting women's uh proper role recognized and valued speaking of being a woman you know in often a, a male dominated field at least in the past hopefully that is changing as you imply but nonetheless um whether as a woman or otherwise, uh, everyone you know tends to hit uh, the buffers at some stage in terms of being entrepreneurs, innovators, you know, change agents. <laughs> change doesn't happen easily. Sometimes it happens very slowly. So let's consider some of the perhaps inevitable obstacles that you have faced along the way in your very interesting entrepreneurial, innovative uh, career. But how have you dealt with some of those obstacles that you faced? And the question is specifically, what have been some of the challenges you've faced in your career and how have you overcome them? Uh, I think it. I think it is really important when we have conversations like this that we do talk about the challenges. So, so um, because it's not always, you know, sunshine and lollipops or whatever the saying is. Uh, and and you know, I've predominantly worked in a male agriculture, you know, in a male dominated industry, uh, and so there have been some of those challenges. I would also like to say from the outset, I've had fantastic mentors, both male and female. Uh, and I think the piece for me is about being really clear about how I want to show up and what I want to do. So being really intentional with where I thought I could fit into something and and how I thought I could work towards the goal that the group had or whatever that might be. And so, for example, if I think about the land care group I worked for, you know, it, it was really important that we were clear on our vision, right, that we were clear on what how did we want to be part of our community? Um, you know, what was our part of the community? What was the piece of that that we could work on and really um, own and progress on behalf of the the southwest Queensland corner or whatever it might be? And then how is that going to be the case? And so then for, for me, it was very much around, well, how do I want to show up in that space? What is it that I can contribute that maybe others can't? Or how can I add value that will lead us towards something? So it helped in some ways, you know, keep my ego in check, helped me manage the male, female, you know, challenges that can sometimes occur. I was often younger and there with the technical expertise, but not necessarily the, you know, the lived experience. And and so I think this piece around, you know, showing respect, being clear on intent helped with some of the challenges that you know that comes with being younger comes with being female um you know when when we're working in these you know fairly 
tricky communities or tricky challenges because I guess the other barrier sometimes that, that we found was there's just not that many of us you know so how do we do all of the things that we want to do when we're coming from small communities or when our population is is not high how how are we going to do the things that need to be done it's a lower base of numbers of volunteers just logistically there's not that many of us or it means that you know there's just not as much funding available or whatever it might be so I think there's some of those just really practical challenges we often found as well yeah I think look, that whole area is very interesting you know you t- you mentioned the co- this comment you know intentional approaches and showing up and I, I I think you know from previous discussion I've had with you we're talking here about your values base but I know also that you a lot, a lot along with a lot of other very effective um, managers and change agents uh, do actually incorporate values into a sort of approach where you you actually start with a vision for what needs to be changed I mean not always in this sequence um, you have a strong values base which you refer to there to keep you on track and that is what in turn you know structures your mission your approach your basic day-to-day approach to achieve what you want to achieve I hope I've got that right but I think it would be very useful as we come up to this uh, next question or to incorporate this um, to you you to talk a little bit about that because I think it would be very fascinating uh, for you know the listeners out there who might be coming into this environmental space or any other come to that how do you achieve effective change how can you help drive it so actually just ask you a little bit to expand a little bit on that perhaps before we go into the next question yeah sure sure so so i think you know we do hear the terms vision mission values often um and maybe it sends a shiver up people's spine from a workshop they've been to or something but I guess for me, you know, I want to be really clear about where can, you know, there's a lot going on, right, Andrew? There's a problem every corner you look. And and I'm never going to be able to solve all of them. And I'm certainly never going to be able to solve them all by myself. But I guess over the years, what I have looked at is, you know, what are the ones I'm actually interested in solving for starters uh, and why? And, and, how will I know I've succeeded? So what does success look like? You know, and they're questions we often hear, but but for me, I need to keep it practical. I am rarely the smartest person in the room. And so I want to be really clear around what's the problem I think I can help solve. How will I know that we've moved the needle and what will success look like? Those sorts of questions, I think, help keep us on track. And by that, I mean, help us see that when it is all going to hell in a handbag and it, nothing's worked and we've had a tough day and we had a meeting with somebody and it didn't go at all the way we thought it would, you know, we can we we can remind ourselves that we are working towards something bigger than all of us. And, and I think that actually helps me personally, that helps keep me um, clear on where I fit in you know, what my contribution to the greater good is if if I think about the language that I kind of use. Now, that might seem airy-fairy for some people, but I think, you know, if we just say we want to work hard and then die, (laughs) that's not super inspiring for most of us, right? But if I say I want to contribute to viable and vibrant communities and this is what that looks like for me, we need to make money, we need to, you know, we need to live in viable communities. Uh, I live in Gundawindi because I want to, not because I can't live anywhere else. And I think, you know, if we think about some of our barriers, the the urban country divide is one of those other challenges we often have. So it is about, you know, I, I say I'm not a tree. I live here because I want to, not because I can't live anywhere else. And that's really important for me. Um, you know, I vibrant looks to me like people are contributing. There's an element of volunteering. We're not expecting that everybody else will do it for us. Um, and and that we have the diversity of thought and the diversity of interests that makes it an interesting community to live in. So, you know, for some that's going to look like the arts. For others it's going to be sport. For somebody else it's going to be, um, it's going to be, you know, a chance to have a beautiful environment around them, whatever that looks like. But, you know, I think I think it is really important that we find a couple of things that we think we can do um, that will make the world a better place and we narrow in on that. You are not going to see me, you know, doing too much in youth education because I don't have kids, I probably swear too much and I figure somebody else is dealing with that. But you will definitely see me in the space of 
the role of women in regional communities, the role of innovation in helping us look at how we're going to deal with all of the challenges that, you know, we've got coming at us from regions uh, and making sure that, you know, people that often don't end up with a voice around the table have a chance to have somebody who will speak on their behalf. Uh, so that looks like, you know, supporting the roles and the voice of Indigenous people, of women, um, you know, people, you know, the minorities, let's call it, who often don't get a voice. That's where you'll see me hanging out and then there'll be other areas where it would be weird to see me because it's not my, it's not it's not the piece of the problems or the piece of the puzzle that I think I can add value to. Yeah, really interesting, Julia. Just, you know, just picking up a few points, I suppose, at the simplest was, don't try and do it all, um, which is an impossibility anyway, but some people do try and set out to do that, don't they, and get sort of sidetracked as a result. But coming more specifically to the, some of the points you made before, be intentional about your objectives. You know, pick your objectives, but not just, again, pick them at random, but based on a clear understanding of your capacities to affect change. You know, and that in turn is based on your values, your skill set, your interests, what you can bring to the decision making table. And I just think also some of the the things you mentioned there, particularly around that the value, that importance of uh, you know vision, mission, and values framing of change agent work or management work, the wider value of that uh, in terms of you know whether it be in business or outside of business. I mean, I'm just thinking in government, for instance, government decision making that hopefully is moving us, albeit rather too slowly, towards a more genuinely sustainable world that is an ecologically sustainable, more socially fair. An economically prosperous world you you just would would lo love to see more vision coming out of government at various levels backed up by genuine values of what matters in society and that would be driving the agenda and we can all hope that we might live long enough to actually see that but to actually have the model of that taking place you know with people like yourself in the business agricultural sector at least that's a start fantastic really inspiring to hear that okay so as we come along now coming through the interview i suppose just coming back to you personally uh as an example as a, an example of a very inspiring woman change agent uh, doing this work i think people are very interested in you know especially around the story of a life type of approach you know what makes people tick well how does this person do it all you know it's it's great you know you see the interest in things like australian story on the tv and stuff like that people love to hear stories of other people and often around you know what inspires them what makes them tick how do they do what they do and how do they keep on doing it so in your particular case julia how do you feel your professional work is connected to your own well-being motivation and determination what what do you draw from that work yeah, so so I actually think a lot of this came from my upbringing. So I grew up in a really small community, uh, as I said, north of Roma. And so the expectation was that we all just had to do stuff to to make the community work. We all had to, you know, help at the tennis days or we all had to do something when we had theatre restaurants or events at the hall, you know. So this expectation that the world will, you know, I... It, not only should I, but I will do something to help others was just, I think it's not until recent years I've realised that that's actually quite unusual and not as many people had that as, a, as an expectation growing up. So I think what I've always just taken for granted maybe is more unique than I realised, Andrew. Um, so, I mean, I just have a built-in, genuinely just between family and community upbringing, a built-in that if I can do something to help somebody, then then the expectation is that I will. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, I'm really grateful now that that is a core value of, of mine and members of my family. Um, and, and, so, and so often, you know, particularly now that I have my own business or I'm involved with some businesses and I, and I play more advocacy roles, there's, a, there's, there's really no line between personal Julia and professional Julia. Maybe professional Julia doesn't exist. No, she should. Um, but, you know, because, because it is very much uh, what, I, what I say I do or, or what I'm talking about is because of where I live and what I and the life I want to live and so I'm and but I'm conscious that I am probably in a small percentage of people to do that uh, I, I genuinely think um, you know I've been very grateful to work on projects that have really made a difference and at the same time I worked really hard to make sure that those projects made a difference so so you know I I um 
I see my piece in that. But I think I think you know I'm I'm really conscious of the of the work that I do. I was quite crook a few years ago, so I think you know a bit of a life, um, you know, some some health challenges, and you know, I mean, again, we don't want terrible life experiences to help teach us something, but. If they happen to us, then then we we need to pull some good out of that, and and so that did also kind of help me. I had breast cancer at a fairly young age, and and you know, so that did really give me time to stop and think about what I wanted, what would this next chapter look like, how would I do things differently if I had a chance, and and I kind of did have that chance to press pause and and go again, and and so yeah, I, I'm really. Um, you know, I still have a very full life. It's still fairly chaotic and all of the rest of it. But I, I do really think that what I do now is is all on a track towards, you know, being a really good community citizen. That, again, there are so many themes in that that we could pick out, uh, which we uh, just briefly. But you know, that, that whole idea of res- what, whether we, you know, contributing citizen, responsible citizen, in an era where it does seem to be sadly falling away, or it has up until very recently, you know, you mentioned that, you you feel that yourself, you think back to that early era on the land. And I know, you know, through um, contacts I have in Australia, relatives, etc., you know, that seemed to have been a much more common model back in the day, you know, people were on umpteen committees, they were contributing to their small communities in, in myriads of ways, that doesn't just seem to be the, the case so much now. And there's there's been a lot of writing about that as well, hasn't there? But it's fantastic that Again, you know, we hopefully possibly that can be brought back, that can be regenerated. And in fact, it's absolutely essential that it is the responsible citizen making a contribution. I almost that echo, that Kenneth Kennedy and echo of ask not what my community can do for me. I'm paraphrasing it, but what I can do for my community. Mm. And and given the yeah. challenges we face now, environmentally, socially, and economically, it, it is incumbent upon us all to make that contribution. I mean, it's not just, it, it's a nice add-on. I mean, it's going to be increasingly absolutely important and central that we all make our, our you know, proportionate contribution, our fair and proportionate contribution. But, um, you know, and again, that also that other issue that you often do here with people for whatever, however it's been caused, but people are obliged to take pause, to stop in a very busy life, perhaps to reflect. And often when they do reflect, they either perhaps re- it reinforces an existing um, approach, an existing inclination, an existing set, set of values, or perhaps it causes them to say, no, I need something different here, uh, a different journey, a different uh, path forward. So again, you know, interesting themes there for you. Um, so look, you know, as we move through this, you clearly are a, a very uh, focused and intentional person and you're doing tons of work, you know, all these um, ex- exciting things that you've already completed. But I know through uh, previous contact with you that that's not the end of it. I mean, you are working on on quite a few uh, projects as you would be. But just to ask you uh, the next question, are you working on any, any specific current exciting projects that really energize you? Thank you, Andrew. Uh, there's there's two projects I want to call out if I can that that are, are really good. So Glenrack is a what was it's a natural resource management community group in the Northern Tablelands of of New South Wales, predominantly around Glen Innes, um, and they've done some great work. They're a really good example of an organisation that has evolved as the communities evolved, as the challenges that farmers are facing have evolved and, and the challenges that communities have faced have evolved. And so they've ended up with a program or they ended up with some resources to be able to deliver a program and we've been partnering, we've been doing that together around how we can really support community confident community champions so so you know what is this piece of volunteering and how do we make sure that as people take on a role around a committee or a community organization they know what they do are doing they understand their role it aligns with who they are individually and and we have people who are there who are genuinely willing to contribute and also understand the role that that takes and so uh it's been a it's been a program we've been doing with Glenrack. um It'll be a 12-month project and, and it's been really good to look at how we can make sure that regardless of age and experience, if you are taking on a role, whether it's pony club, PNC, show society, council or, a, you know, New South Wales farmers, you, you, you've got a, you've got a skill set, you've got a, a network that can help you with that. So we've really 
been enjoying that. And the other work I've loved and to be part of is some work that's come out of the Rural Economy Centre of Excellence, and that's across Queensland. And it's a it's a collaboration of a lot of the regional universities across Queensland. So USQ, uh, JCU, CQU and UQ in Brisbane. And it's really been looking at how communities are going to transition given climate change and given climate variability challenges. And so how do we be proactive uh, and strategic around what that might mean and what are communities looking for rather than us reacting next time there's a drought uh, or having to make decisions at a point of crisis because I'm yet to find people who make good decisions then. Uh, so certainly the, yeah, so the Glenrack and the Rural Economy Centre of Excellence work's been really rewarding, tough, challenging and fun, some good humans around. So that's probably a good example of some projects I like to get amongst if it's, it's, it's a bit challenging and messy, but you're working with good humans and you can have some fun along the way. So we've been talking about the, the decline, or I was, the, the possible decline of uh, responsible citizenship, but there you are tapping into obviously loads of community spirit uh, and willingness to contribute uh, down there in New South Wales. That's really fantastic to hear that still around and you're helping to catalyse that. And then this Rural Economy of Excellence um, project as well. Interestingly, in terms of, you know, that that comment you just made about transition, we've just heard the, the exciting news uh, from the federal government that there will now be a net zero authority. Uh, hot off the press, um, long needed, but you know, mm. finally come to come to pass. So mm. let's hope great things will come out of that. Yes, let's you know, Julia, you've covered. Yeah, absolutely, you've covered so many points here, and I, I, I do ask a summarising question of each guest as we come up now towards the very end of the um, podcast. In a couple of one, just a couple of questions left. You know, to help summarise that, based on that idea that people tend to uh, remember the first and last thing they heard in a presentation of any kind, so. What, what, do you have a short, piffy take-home message, a few sentences or so, which could help reinforce the ideas you've been talking about today? You know, what would would you like them to take away from this? Uh, two things, and neither of them are mine. Um, one is a phrase, uh, a phrase I heard: um, "Ideas without action are delusion." Uh, so, so the ideas are good unless you're going to do something about it. Stop kidding yourself and move on to something else. So ideas without action are delusion. And and for me, I think, you know, we can't do anything with a thousand ideas. Pick two or three and do something with them. You'll see action and that will give you momentum. So ideas without action are delusion would be one. And the other one that I've heard more recently and I really like is your reputi reputation is repetition. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that for me, if I look back at what I've repeatedly done and where I've repeatedly shown up and the conversations I repeatedly, repeatedly have, that does align with my reputation. And, and I think, you know, that's the other thing to think of. So, so probably in this space of narrow in, focus on what's important to you and crack on with that. Some fantastic sharp points there. You know, I'm a fan myself of aphorisms, epigrams, whatever you want to call them, you know, short little bits of wisdom that can easily be recalled to mind uh, that just, you know, sort of spark off that understanding in your head of what matters, what counts, so you can focus. I suppose that is another uh, reflection of your intentional approach to work. So finally, Julia, the very final question of this fantastic interview, again, asking each of the guests in this series to tap into the depth of their accumulated professional experience, skills and insights to offer any advice they might have for uh, our listeners to this podcast series, particularly women, because it is you know, geared to women specifically, but a general audience as well, who might be thinking about stepping up into an environmental support role of some, some shape or form in business, agriculture or whatever other sector. Um, and you know, whether that's also involved in capacity building and natural resource management, the sort of uh, community facilitation roles you've mentioned as well. Do you have any advice uh, to offer to the audience on that basis? Uh, my last piece of advice is find a network, find a group, uh, whatever the group might be, but it is it is lonely and isolating uh, if you're trying to make change by yourself and I'm not sure it will be sustainable. So, so uh, I would suggest find a network of people you can be part of who are wanting to achieve what you want to achieve. That will help you in the days when you don't have a win. Uh, that will help you on the days when it's challenging and they will be the people that will 
you know, cheer loudly with you as you all achieve what it is that you're wanting to achieve. So do it with others would, would probably be my last piece of advice. Again, it's backed up increasingly by psychological research if we actually needed that to suggest that, you know, a group effort, a group collaboration is going to be more supportive psychologically, especially if you're in, going into work that is pushing the envelope in some capacity, is novel, is innovative, you know, in, in terms of that sort of pushback uh, dynamic we've been talking about before. So, Julia, that r- rounds off the interview, a very stimulating interview. It's been absolutely brilliant to talk to you. And I know you will given our audience some inspiring ideas which could help inform their thinking about their own possible next steps toward taking environment support actions, which could help inform their own conversations related to the topics you've raised with, for instance, their friends, families, colleagues within employing organizations and in their community groups or professional associations. But after all of that, and for now, on behalf of my support organisation, Householders Options to Protect the Environment, it just remains for me to thank you so much for our conversation today. I've really enjoyed speaking with you, Andrew. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to a podcast episode in the series Queensland Women, Inspiring Stories from Environmental Champions. The series was produced for Householders Options to Protect the Environment Incorporated as part of the Queensland Women's Week 2023 event and it aligns with the objectives of the Queensland Women's Strategy 2022-2027. Hope thanks the Queensland Department of Justice and Attorney General's Office for Women and Violence Prevention for the generous funding support which made this podcast project possible. Please consult the episode text notes for possible follow-up material on topics discussed and any relevant contact details should you wish to respond to anything you've heard. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider promoting it across your networks and giving it a positive rating in your preferred podcast app. My name is Andrew Nicholson, producer of the series, and thank you for listening.